Hello everyone, this is quite um, fun for me because it's turning to my undergrad university, so um, I'm kind of like very scared. Um, right, um, so, uh, stone knob points and flake stone bars, SAPs and FSBs as I'm going to refer to them as, um, they've been identified in Orkney for about 150 years by um, archaeologists, antiquarians and enthusiasts. Um, the main issues with them is that not many have come from well-dated contexts, and um, the, the association and study of them has been done on their shape and form, and trying to relate that to their actual function is a real problem in the historical literature. Um, subsequently, they have been used as a cultural marker for wider social changes, uh, see Clock 2006. Um, in terms of the typology, it's, it's increasingly worrying um, by this, um, that the archaeological interpretation of FSBs and SAPs has been based on analogies from other material types as well. So a recent 1979, she did a very good empirical study of the R points, um, but she only uses the wooden uh, comparison of the Donner Upland experiment by Hansen um, and doesn't actually directly experiment and test her own research and equate this. So this new research tries to change this. Uh, which is the return? Uh, so, as I've said, the lack of research elsewhere has uh, created uh, typology and chronological problems uh, for FSBs and SAPs. The current chronology of SSBs and SAPs stratigraphically date from the late Neolithic to the early Iron Age. Importantly, the problem arises when little is known about the change over time. Um, so, this we could be dealing with some two to three thousand years. Um, and dating at the current radiocarbon dates is two th um, from about roughly, the, the hiatus is from 2000 to 400 AD. Um, but this could be open to question with new sites like Tosnes being um, excavated by um, Ease Archaeology. Um, the interesting that Lara in 2011 has late Neolithic context of these tool types. We have to, um, so by the uh, so you've got obviously a very changing shift in social practice um, from uh, very expressive social communities in the late Neolithic to isolated communities current, with current understanding in the Bronze Age and um, changes to um, very much a social house societies um, culture emerging in the Iron Age again. A uh, recent synthesis uh, by Anne Clark's 2006 work separates the core stone tools into two types, um, the less common and the common artifacts. Um, this was very useful at the time. In um, It actually collated a large body of data which hadn't really been looked at. Um, but the real issues I have with this um, is that it um, only uses them as social markers. Um, and there's, although there has been limited empirical investigation into scale lives by Clark in 1989, she doesn't actually um, relate more about the different tool types and, and focus on different tool types individually and then collate them into a more um, contextual understanding of the, the societal changes. So she's, she's, um, she relies quite heavily on the scale knives and uh, the butchery side of things to interpret a um, Neolithic chronology from an early to a late um, and obviously with the new work with Richards in 2015 of how societies that might come into question with her new project on um, the stone tools of Orkney. <coughs> so the research um, historically antiquarians um, have really been under, uh, able to identify the different um, shapes. Um, so in the 1980s 18, 18, 1868, um, Mitchell was very influential, um, but he didn't really able to distinguish the variations within uh, types. So these two main typologies are taken from uh, Clark 2006, which she notes um, from the literature. She doesn't actually give a, a variation proportionally, but she shows that the FSBs are quite, uh, the, the general types need to be subrectangular, ovid, and rectangular. And the two on the right hand side, right hand side, are from Reese 1979, um, which are the two majority types which are in Orkney. But there is also another um, double-ended, um, which is type A, um, but that doesn't really appear in Orkney, so it's not really important. Um, so typologies of these tools have remained changing ever since um, uh, they were first discovered. Um, and however, if the classification um, 
with Reese on these FSBs has to, um, been too finite. So um, ultimately, it became confused. Um, so there's a general sense that these tools are not really known, so they've been juggling with them for a long time. Um, and it really confuses things when you try and make sense of it all. Um, the most recent work, um, as I said earlier, about the experimental side of things, although she has demonstrated a typology, um, Clark 2006, um, this is based mainly on shape and also the cultural markers of the context and where they're found. So there's not direct link with the function of these artefacts, which is really important if we need to move forward with typology. <coughs> so I'm not trying to say that um, what I've done is a solution. I'm just saying every, um, even the hardest puzzles have a solution. Um, so it's possible to make a difference, even how small it is. Um, so the major research concerns for this project had to try and move beyond the traditional focus of research into Neolithic Orkney, um, trying to better contextualise FSBs and SAPs in a later prehistoric context, using the scant amounts of information. At the same time, this had to move beyond the physical typology and actually relate the artefacts to their function, something which had only been done analogously. This is where using a multi-method approach really helps. So I'm saying the, the, the wood um, comparison of wear patterning with the R points, the stone R points particularly, it's two very different materials. Um, there are some similarities, but they're, they're, they are quite unique um, materials at the end of the day. One's inorganic, one's organic. It, it, there are slight subtle variations. Um, so the multi-method approach trying to include experimental archaeology analogies will help um, inform the interpretation. So this is from my experiment. Um, so I combined the experimental approaches with a um, multi-method of the analysis and statistics and uh, the contextual uh, in line with what Clark had already done and also Reese, and tried to br bring that into a more regional understanding of the Orkney uh, changes in social prehistory through the late Neolithic to early Iron Age try to contextualise them broadly as the, because of the lack of dated examples and uh, context, it meant that it made my life increasingly difficult as I was studying these things. Um, from the experiment, I understood that this is one way of doing it. Um, so it's a Crookard uh, construction. And then the important things about this to bear in mind is that we've got the surviving stone um, artefacts, but the wooden uh, um, examples are organic, so you can't actually have the physical um, constructions of these these artifacts. There is some information about the uh, different types. So there's two types. So there's Crookard and then there's uh, Donner Upland or um, Stilt. Sorry, Donner Upland or Swedenard, which is a bit like the Norwegian uh, varieties, where you've got a single shaft going straight down. Um, but there is some evidence for that type, but uh, it's a bit mixed because a lot of these things are broken. Um, so it's a bit varied. Um, Again, the flake stone bars, I didn't really explain at the start, they're, they have stone mattocks is the general interpretation from the literature. And um, so that's the, one of the experiments. You probably noticed that my experimental one was very large. That was my fault because I didn't really have the good communication with the um, guy making it. And he did say that the importance is the strength in the actual um, handle and the only uh, you have the main trunk and then you have an offshoot which is large enough to carry the stone and that the only one available was a very large one. So the, the experimental um, replica was probably upscaled quite, um, quite significantly. So that might have had an impact on how it's used. Um, so where from the wear patterning, um, I found uh, that the flake stone bar was very consistent with Toff's nest on the left here and that's the experimental one on the right. Um, and then again, this is from Toff's Nest, and this is my experimental one on the right here. Um, so the typology tried to move away from um, Reese and Clark, but it, it tried to combine the two, um, so take the best bits um, and move forward. Um, so I tried to show it visually, um, so that the, the, the wear patterning, um, so you've got the straight uh, striations, which are mostly from use, Lateral, probably post depositional wear, and crisscross is post depositional wear as well. The, uh, the, the shapes here at the bottom are all from use. Uh, so the squared is particularly from fracturing, so this is very friable um, sandstone. Um, 
And it's quite interesting that you're using quite friable sandstone in relation to their use um, by the fact that these were probably less um, important than the wooden um, aspects of the technology. Um, so they're using the handles um, again and again, and the, the um, actual stone uh, elements are being made, fitted into the existing handle and then discarded. That's only my interpretation from the experimental process because the experimental process is divided into three areas. It was divided into the uh, hafting uh, using the wood and then the, the production of the stone, which I did, and then the cultivation, which I did. Um, so there was, there was a three part process. Um, and again, I tried to include the uh, broken elements of the uh, technology. So all of these were the, the subjective classifications of all the broken elements that I actually looked at. I looked at 304 artifacts um, uh, from the museums in Kirkwall um, County Museum. And it's important to kind of look at this in terms of the statistics. Um, so from the analysis, I looked at the partial and complete examples and it shed some interesting light generally about the nature of the size of effort, the uh, mattox, stone mattox FSBs, that there are, there's probably a larger um, element to the construction types um, and the types of material used, and then obviously there's percentages of wearing that was found. This is only a sample, so this is not definitive. Um, and it was about technological assessment, so it was about trying to tie the archaeological sample to the analogy a bit better. And then that's the, uh, the odd points there. So this is the important bit about the cluster analysis. Um, I tried to move away uh, from just sitting there with the data and um, doing a stylistic um, study uh, by looking at the analysis and the proportion of the statistic forms of the analysis. Um, so this, the sample study elucidated that the size range of FSBs was slightly larger, as I've mentioned uh, uh, just now, um, hinting that these tools could have belonged to a few different examples of different types of influence. So I kind of experimented stylistically by reconstructions at drawings. So I couldn't show you everything because it's a very short 15-minute presentation. Um, uh, but the analysis of broken SAPs also demonstrated that the fragments helped to understand in conjunction with the experiment that most of the common stresses on the R points was at the juncture between the end of the wooden construction and where the actual uh, plough went into the soil. Um, so the cluster analysis alongside with the proportion analysis <coughs> helped to illustrate the typology of FSBs and shape probably had less of an impact on the overall purpose of, and function of the tool. Um, the size may have had more of an impact um, of the varied function aspects of these tools in cultivation. Um, in addition, the clutch analysis and the proportional analysis of SAPs um, and its comparison to existing typology suggested that most examples from Orkney were predominantly butt-ended and the relation to their emphasised that the length was important of these things. Um, it's a bit sketchy, um, but that's still a work in progress. Um, so that's the um, odd stone ones, our points. Uh, in the context, um, typology in the contextual analysis was lacking in any real sense of chronology variation over time. So on the right is um, an FSB comparison um, with the late Neolithic, early Iron, uh, early Bronze Age, and late Bro Middle Bro late Bronze Age, and early Iron Age, from Tofts Ness, um, Crossy, Cro uh, Crossy Crown, and Scale and Green. Um, so Crossy Crown showed very little variation. Scale is a big problem um, because the archive. I tried desperately trying to get hold of the archive and um, couldn't get anywhere with it. Um, so. There is a lot of information in the excavation report, but the excavation report serves as a model of the actual site, and there's nothing in the background to study apart from the artifacts. Um, uh, so the changing typology doesn't really uh, suggest there is any variation in the shape of these themselves. There's an emphasis on the main types that were noted by Clark and um, others, um, but the, the general pattern seems to be that there's um, a sort of movement between um, each. <coughs> um, the general pattern is um, 
that these were the, the contextual analysis showed that they were most numerously um, made in the late uh, Bronze Age um, and actually used. Um, so I used um, Farrell 2009 as a quite a good um, comparison because she deals with the, the climate and it shows that although there's limited um, agriculture going on generally, um, in the late Bronze Age you get more of a use of uh, art cultivation for arable practices on um, fairly ameliorated soils because of the workability of the land, so they're adding to the, the structure of the land by, through manuring. So I have been really nervous, so I might have missed quite a lot, so I do apologise. Um, but generally, typology is still useful, um, but it needs to be adaptable. So the, uh, the general emphasis I want you to take away from this is uh, the experimental side of things is very important um, and useful, and I think it's been neglected in some areas, not at all, um, particularly with stone from Orkney in the core stone tools, and I think it needs to be used more rigorously um, and it needs to be adaptable and the typology needs to re-engage with the material and, and as illustrated the shape doesn't necessarily dictate what the tool was used for um, on the, the stone side of things um, and the connected typology to the use and provenance of artefacts and it needs to be viable for the future and I'm really sorry. <laughs>